الرحيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا وعظيمنا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع نفوسنا أبي القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المكرمين المنطجبين أما بعد فقد قال الله تعالى في كتابه الكريم وقوله الحق بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها النبي حرض المؤمنين على القتال إنكم من كم عشرون صابرون يغلبوا مئتين وإنكم منكم مئة يغلبوا ألفا من الذين كفروا بأنهم قوم لا تفقهون صدق الله العلي العظيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وأحنا نقطة من لساني يفقه قولي بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته We started the first of our discussions last night and the theme that we've set for these nights is that we are aiming first to fix ourselves before we look outwards and try to fix the world and continuing in that now that we have Uh, made that resolution, now that we realize that it is the most important first step to make in order to improve the world itself, we have been able to get up onto our two feet. And inshallah, in tonight's discussion, we'll go through the most important quality that we need to have that will allow us to maintain our position. That is to stay standing. And if we fall down, it gives us the tools to stand back up again. And that is the quality of sabr which translates in English as, as patience or forbearance. But what is, what exactly does sabr mean? Well, the great Arif, uh, Khaj Abdullah al-Ansari, whose textbook is used in the houses to, treat, uh, to teach practical Arafan, he defines sabr to mean restraining the self from complaint about hidden anguish. In other words, or in, in plain English, it means that whatever comes your way, you soldier through it. Whatever happens, we continue in our way towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we don't give up. What sabr is not, and this is very important to, to establish right from the get-go, sabr is not complete silence. Sabr does not mean I'm just going to put up with it and that's it, I'm not going to do anything about it. Because this ideology is quite dangerous, both, both on an individual level and on a societal level. On an individual level, sometimes we repress ourselves, right? We think that the situation is as it is. You know, I'm stuck with this situation, I'm just going to have to continue the way I am. And we almost fall back into this martyrdom complex, that we feel that we're sacrificing ourselves for others. Now, in rare cases, that, is, that does take place. But most of the time, we have to take it into our own hands to try and change the situation. So sabr is not that we just give in to the whims of the situation. And on a more broad scale, it involves, uh, it does not involve allowing a tyrant to continue his rule. There's a long-standing tradition, there's a widespread belief that you shouldn't stand up to a tyrant. It's in, in a lot of Islamic circles that you'll see. This is the sort of argument that they put forth. And you can almost understand why this ideology has proliferated, right? That the tyrants of the time, they thought, well, you know, this is a great teaching, right? Allah teaches patience. Therefore, if your ruler is evil over you, then be patient because he is a test for you and you are a test for them. But this is not what sabr is either. Because that is how tyrants thrive. They need the silent majority. That's what they need. As long as they're not doing anything to oppose them, then they can continue their tyrannical rule. So complaining is important at times, but when it is channeled through productive and positive means, not when it's just used to continually sap our energy and our positivism. Sabar itself, patience is mentioned, the word is used in the Quran 73 times in 69 different verses of the Holy Quran. 
And Allah constantly emphasizes on how essential equality it is. In the 8th surah of the Holy Quran, verse number 46, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands us, وَاصْبِرُوا إِنَّ اللَّهَ مَعَ الصَّابِرِينَ And be patient, for surely Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is with those who are patient. And Imam al-Sadiq, salawatu Allahi wa salamuhu alayhi He tells us regarding sabr that the analogy of patience to faith, to iman, is that patience is the head and iman is the body. If you remove the head, then there is no way that your faith, that your iman can thrive. It is that essential, that fundamental equality that we have to sort of procure. And when we go through difficult times and we are patient, we are rewarded magnanimously. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes sure that we see the fruit of what we have gone through. There is a hadith again from Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam. That is recorded in Usul al-Kafi. That he says, when we are in the qabr, when we are in the grave, and we have the two angels, Munkar and Nakir, they are questioning us, they are interrogating us. They will be four protectors that are around us. On the right side, we have the Salah, on the left, Zakah, and in front of us, we have our virtuous qualities, and underneath us, we have our patience. And the Imam tells us that if all other fail, if our zakat is not successful in protecting us, if our salat is not successful, if our virtues are not, then sabr will come forward and say, move aside, for I alone will protect my master. So this is the sort of emphasis that we find on sabr in the Islamic tradition. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he rewards us to the extent that one tradition from Imam al-Sadiq says that we get rewarded the amount of reward that a thousand martyrs get if we manage to get through our difficult times while maintaining our Iman. But there are two sides to patience, and sometimes we, we sort of forget the first one. Patience doesn't always start in difficult times. Now, of course, that's where it's most common, but the seed of patience begins in times of ease, or at least it starts with shukr, with gratefulness, with thankfulness. And that changes our perspective. When we appreciate what we have, then our whole, again, we experience what we discussed yesterday, a paradigm shift, a change in our perspective when we have gratitude for what we have. And then the second aspect of patience is, as we commonly know, is to go through difficult times and to prosper. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Holy Quran, when he talks about shukr, he contrasts it to kufr. The opposite of kufr, he tells us, is uh, shukr. In Surah Al-Baqarah, verse number 152, then remember me, and I will remember you. Be grateful, and do not reject me. So he places them as uh, opposites. And Shaitan knew this, right? Shaitan is a, is a smart cookie, right? He knows what he's doing. We sort of, sometimes we, we paint him as this as this arrogant, uh, as this, uh, as, as a fool. But he, he knows what he's doing. And he identifies the power of shukr. As Allah quotes him in the Holy Quran, in the seventh surah, verse number 17, when he is condemned to earth and he says that he's going to try and misguide everybody, he says that I will certainly come to them, before them, from in front of them, from behind, from the right and from the left, and O oh Allah, you will not find them amongst the thankful. So in his mission statement, in the devil's mission statement itself, he says, I will get rid of their shukr. And that should tell us something about how important a quality it is to have. And if we can be grateful for what we have in times of ease, then we can also, we can have the fortitude to go through times of difficulty. And there's no one, uh, who, who, there's no story which is better known, not only in the Islamic tradition, but in the Judeo-Christian, all Abrahamic traditions have the story of Job, of the story of Nabi Ayyub alayhi salam. Now, Allah recounts his story repeatedly through the Holy Quran. And he uses him as a paragon of patience. In Surah Sa'd and Surah Al-Nuh, those are the two main surahs of the Qur'an where he talks a little bit in depth about what happens. So Nabi Ayyub alayhi salam, he's a prophet who's sent to his nation. And he's constantly grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's constantly saying, Alhamdulillah, shukran. But Shaytan, he says, Ya Allah, you know, I know you're proud of this man. But you know what? The only reason he's like this, the only reason he's happy, the only reason he is thriving is because you've given him everything, right? It's easy for anybody to thank you and to praise you when they have what they have. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he does something very strange here. You know, Allah works in mysterious ways sometimes. 
And he says to Shaytan, you know what? If that's what you think, go ahead. Do what you will. Shaytan is, is surprised. What do you mean? You can take away the blessings from Nabi Ayyub one by one. And I guarantee you, he will still continue to worship me. He'll still continue to be grateful to me. So Shaytan is, is uh, he can't believe his luck. He now has opportunity to have some very restricted power. It's quite important that it's very restricted, not over his reason, over his reason or his uh, thought processes. So one by one, Shaytan begins to get rid of his blessings. First, he gets rid of his wealth. Because Nabi Ayyub, he had many lands, he had lots of livestock, lots of money, and all of a sudden, they were all gone. Shaytan looks at Nabi Ayyub, alayhi salam, and he continues to say, Alhamdulillah, shukran So Shaytan, he moves on to the next step. Nabi Ayyub had many children. So Shaytan takes them all. All of them die through various circumstances. And now Nabi Ayyub is left without any children. And when Shaytan looks at him, he sees that he is still saying, Alhamdulillah, shukran I mean, what does he have to do? So he goes to the next step. And he takes away Nabi Ayyub's health, alayhi salam. Now his health begins to deteriorate, and according to, 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 to I guess, the consensus opinion, because there's a bit of a difference of opinion here, but he starts to develop all sorts of different diseases of the skin. So it's very obvious to everybody around. Everyone else can see now that he's gotten physically sick as well. And still he's saying, Alhamdulillah, still he's saying, Shukran. But what happens next, I mean, for when I read the story, this is what I find most painful. What happens next is some of the great friends of Nabi Ayyub, they come to him and they say, look, Ayyub, you're a good person and we like you, but please tell us what sin you have committed. Tell us what you've done wrong. Then we can ask for forgiveness for you. So imagine his situation has reached the extent that not only his enemies are spreading rumors about him, but even his closest allies think that he has done something wrong. And surely that has to hurt deep down, especially for a prophet. And yet still he just says, Shukra lillah, alhamdulillah. His wife approaches him and asks him, what is going on? You know, what is happening? Doesn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala love us? And he reproaches her. And he says, and it's a very interesting point he makes, and he reveals the secret to his patience. He says, look, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us whatever we wanted. He gave us so much for many decades. For so many years, everything was perfect, and that was fine. Now that Allah has decided to take away some of what He has given us, and it's only been a few months, maybe a couple of years, and all of a sudden we're supposed to turn on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Never. And He continues to praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He continues to say shukran. And Shaytan's ploy had failed. And Allah details it in Surah Nu, verses number 83 to 84. And when Ayyub called out to his Lord, Indeed, adversity has touched you. So he says, Ya Allah, I'm going through a difficult time. We're not denying the fact he's going through difficulty. He is suffering a lot. Ya Allah, adversity has touched me, but you are the most merciful of the merciful. I mean, imagine, imagine the caliber of this man after he's lost everything. He still says, Ya Allah, you are the most merciful of the merciful. And Allah says, we responded to him and removed what afflicted him of adversity. And we gave him back his family and the like thereof. And this is a mercy and a reminder to the believers. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him back whatever he had before, his health, his family, and his wealth, and he gave him even more. Because this is the ultimate end when we can have sabr and patience. But the secret here, Nabi Ayyub's secret, is that gratitude. That he continues to think about what Allah has given him, focusing on the blessings of what he has. As Imam Ali alayhi salam says, when few blessings come your way, don't drive them away through thanklessness. So with shukr, we have three different levels, right? There's shukr of the qalb, the shukr of the heart, that we, we're, we're sort of grateful in our hearts for what we have. The next level is the shukr of the lisan, that is of the tongue, that we praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we talk good and positively. And the final level of shukr is that it manifests into our actions. That whatever ni'mas Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us, we use them to go in His way. We use them to move towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And again, the key lies in those blessings that we don't really appreciate. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for example, Surah Al-Nahl, verse number 78. 
It is he who brought you forth from your mothers when you knew nothing. He gave you hearing and sight and intelligence and, inf- and affection that you may give thanks to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What does Allah say in Surah Rahman over and over and over again? Which of the favors of your Lord will you deny? There's so much that we have, alhamdulillah. At least we have the ability to see or to hear or to experience emotions. At least, alhamdulillah, we have our physical health to some degree, to varying degrees. And whatever position we're in, there's still something else that we could have lost. But even after we're grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's still important that when we reach the stage where times get tough and we're struggling to move ahead, that we soldier on. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, Surah number 46, verse 35, Therefore, bear up patiently, as the messengers did, that were endowed with faithfulness, and bear up with patience. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, again, He understands us better than we know ourselves. So He hasn't just given us written messages, He's not just given us uh, stories, or uh, He's not just told us to be patient, but He's given us examples. And that's what we find in the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. That when he goes to the people of Ta'if, this was a town nearby Mecca. So he's not having much success in Mecca because they're they're turning against him, they're trying to persecute him, they're torturing his followers. So he goes to Ta'if for a change of, uh, of, of, of strategy. And when he goes to them, immediately when they see him, they start to pelt him with stones. And they physically chase him out of their city. The, uh, the narration tells us that one of the stones hits his forehead and hits his forehead and, and blood comes all over his face. And eventually he manages to escape from them and he sits down, leans on a wall, recuperating, getting enough energy so that he can go home. And as he's sitting there, an angel comes to the Holy Prophet and he says, Ya Rasulullah, I am the angel of the wind. Give me the permission, just give me permission and I will blow them out of existence. Another angel comes and says, I am the angel of the mountain. Just give me the word and I will drop a mountain on this town. Another says, I am the angel of water. Just give me the word and I'll destroy them with the waves. But what does Rasulullah do? He's in this state. He's still in this difficulty. He doesn't even know if he's going to make it back yet. And yet he says to all of them, no. Maybe one of them will be guided. Maybe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give guidance, if not to them, then to their children. So even as he goes through difficulty, he maintains the highest level of patience. And there are some qualities which are so pure, which are so good, that when we witness them, they sort of resonate with our, with our being. They resonate with our soul, something deep down in our consciousness, that when we see it, it has an immediate impact. So for example, arrogance, right? Nobody likes someone who's arrogant. Okay, and we all know that if there's someone who's arrogant, as soon as you see them, it sort of it puts you off. You don't even need to know them very well. You don't like them, right? And the opposite uh, end of that, when you have some good qualities like that, sabr is chief among them. When we have patience, no matter what we're going through, and we continue to stay positive, and that is what makes sabr one of the most beautiful qualities that we can have. The story of Hazrat Bilal al Habashi is one of the best examples of how. A person who goes through difficulty but manages to persevere, they become a lantern for the community. So Hazrat Bilal, he is an Abyssinian from modern days, is from Ethiopia. And he's, he's black, he's very dark skinned. And he converts to the message of the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa He follows his teaching and as a result, when he is discovered that he is a follower of the Holy Prophet, he is tortured. His captor, his master, uh, in in physical terms, in worldly terms, was a man by the name of Umayyah. And he took Hazrat Bilal, he took him out into the desert, on the scorching sands. These, by the way, these sands, they get so hot under the desert sun, you can't touch them. You touch them and it burns your skin. He takes Hazrat Bilal and he lies him on the floor on these desert sands, these boiling sands, and he takes a large boulder and he starts to put it on top of the chest of Hazrat Bilal, crushing him, asking him, telling him, commanding him to give up his faith. And yet, what does he say over and over again? He just says, Ahad, 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 meaning God is one, God is one, God is one. And later on, he says that if I could have thought of anything which would be more hateful to Umayyah, I would have said that. 
This is the this is the patience that he had. And all of the Muslims that are around, they look and they see this marvelous example. They're inspired. It gives them hope. And when Hazrat Bilal is freed, what happens? Because he was patient, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him a, a grand position. He becomes the Muaddin of the Holy Prophet. I mean, for a black man at that time, for an African man with dark skin to have climbed the Kaaba and given the first Alvan is something unprecedented amongst a, a, a people who were that racist as the Arabs of Jahiri. And the verse that I recited at the beginning of this, of this discussion was from Surah 8, verse number 65. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He gives us a little algorithm here, if we are patient. He says, O Prophet, urge the believers to battle. And if they are among you 20 who are patient, who are from the Sabirin, who are patient, then they will overcome 200. And if they are among you 100 who are patient, then they will overcome 1,000. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us that if you can master this skill, if you can take on this quality, this virtue of the soul, then you can become worthy. You can become as, as much as 10 times your own person, 10 times the way that you were before. And we try and maintain patience through small difficulties and through great ones. And there, there is a difference between the two, obviously. Uh, but the, from, from a small perspective, I guess we, we, we have a lot of youth here. I think one example which is quite important is when it comes to our relations with our parents. Because often the way that we think when we're younger is we think black and white, right and wrong, right? If my, if my mother or my father tells me something and I know it's wrong, there's almost an urge to know it's wrong. I have to stand up against this injustice, right? I have to stand up against this, it is wrong. Well, not always, especially not when it comes in the heat of the situation, when things are getting heated and if the parent, if the mother or father says to stop or they tell you to do something, that's it. It's over. You can go and have a discussion later on as to why they were wrong. Because they may well be wrong. Parents aren't infallible. They do get things wrong sometimes. Or maybe the youth will tell us more often than we'd like to think. Uh, but in those situations, we maintain patience. We wait a little bit. Wait for the heat of the situation to pass. And then when we intervene, it makes things better. I mean, when we answer back, which is the gut instinct to do, things sort of spiral out of control. You raise your voice a little bit and mother or father will raise it a little bit and then all of a sudden you find people are having a shouting contest and then, I don't know, people get grounded for a couple of weeks. It's, it's the way it works in every household every day. But, so, so these are the small difficulties and they're relatively easy to, to tune yourself to. But when we come across the greater difficulties in life, that's where the struggle really begins. Okay, we've had the shukr. We've had the small episodes where we've been patient. But what about when life really gets tough? Yesterday, we talked about uh, of, well, the academic that I, uh, that I discussed in detail was Leo Tolstoy, a man who at the pinnacle of his intellect, greatest novelist of all time, he struggles with this notion of suicide. He hides his guns. He stays away from rope because he knows he's going to kill himself. Because he gets lost in the cycle of pessimism, because he's overrun by the misery of existence. And sometimes this can happen. You know, when you lose a loved one, or when your whole world comes crashing down, that is when the test really starts. It's very easy to sit here and to say, be patient, be patient. But when you're in the situation, it's a whole different story. And for that reason, I will quote someone else, someone far more qualified than me. There's a poet by the name of Khalil Gibran, and he's written a, a short poem. And I just want to read out the lines. I'll read it out twice, because it's quite... Uh, it's quite metaphorical, but if you can hold on to the meaning, it's a beautiful poem. He says, Pain is the bitter poison by which the physician within you heals yourself. Therefore, trust the physician and drink his remedy in silence and tranquility. For his hand, though heavy and hard, is guided by the tender hand of the unseen. And the cup he brings though it burns your lips, has been fashioned of the clay which the potter has moistened with his own sacred tears. And the potter refers to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? The unseen refers to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the physician he talks about is the pain that we're going through. So one more time. Pain is the bitter potion by which the physician within you heals your sick self. Therefore, trust the physician and drink his remedy in silence and tranquility. For his hand, though heavy and hard, is guided by the tender hand of the unseen. 
and the cup he brings, though it burns your lips, has been fashioned of the clay which the potter has moistened with his own sacred tears. That last point is the one that gets me the most, right? What is this talk about the tears of God himself? Well, let's think about it this way. Allah loves us more than 70 times our own mothers love us. It's impossible for us to be able to comprehend what that means, right? So when a mother sees a child go through pain, it hurts the mother. It hurts her a lot, right? But sometimes the mother knows it's for the betterment of the child that they need to learn. If you give them ease all the time, it'll actually lead to more hardship in the long run. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who loves us so much more than our own mothers, the pain that he sees us go through, again, ultimately it is for our own good. Ultimately, it means something. So when going through these dark times, the most important thing to remember is that the pain has a purpose. There is a reason that we're going through it. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the divine compensator. Have no worry that in the Akhir, Allah will reward us, as I mentioned yesterday. He'll reward us so much that we'll wish that we could have come back to suffer some more. But sure, that, that's sort of a... Sometimes those consolations are difficult to accept when we're going through difficult times because we want help in this world. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches us that even in this world, the pain is for our own benefit. George Orwell, who's uh, one of the most famous uh, political philosophers of, of, of the recent age, he's written a book by the name of Road to Wigan Pier. And in the latter half of the book, he discusses a few philosophical issues, which are, which are quite, quite intriguing, to be honest. But he talks about the trend of mankind, the way that we're going. And he says that we build more and more machines. And what is a machine? A machine is something that makes our life easier, gets rid of difficulty, right? And as man progresses, he builds more and more machines. And naturally, it follows that therefore we have less and less difficulties. Now, there's no doubt that that is a good thing, right? But he says if you continue this, and you continue this trend to the nth degree, we'll reach a point where we eliminate all meaningful pain and difficulty. And at that point, the human being will transform into something which we would find repulsive. Because they haven't been forged in the fire of pain. There's a, a, a famous scientific, uh, a science fiction novel by the, by the famous author uh, Aldous Huxley. It's called Brave New World. For anyone who's interested in, in, in looking into this concept a little bit more, it's actually it's enlightening. Because we sort of think, you know, if, we, if I got rid of this pain, if I got rid of this suffering, then my life would be the same as it is, but without the pain. But that's naive. It's a one-dimensional thinking. If you get rid of the pain, you change who you really are. And the person who's left behind is much softer. Uh, in, in, in Brave New World, they, they, they have this, uh, among many things, it's, it's a really interesting book, but amongst many things, they have uh, a drug by the name of Soma. And any time they start to feel a little bit distressed, they take it. There's different doses, and the author talks about the doses in detail, what they do. That's it. Why? So that they don't have to face any difficulty. And when you read about them, there's something, there's something visceral that you feel, a sort of disgust on the inside, because these uh, are what these human beings have become in the absence of difficulty. Ibn Khaldun, who is uh, one of the most famous historians of the Islamic golden era, he wrote a book by the name of Al-Muqaddimah. And in this book, he, he essentially founded the modern versions of sociology, of history, and of, uh, sorry, sociology, history, and uh, a critical analysis of certain historical sources. And he talks about something by the name of a cycle of empires that the reason he looks around in the Islamic Golden Age, he, see, he sees how various Muslim empires are falling and various others are coming to light. And under this, this notion, this cycle, he says that the reason why some empires are able to thrive, the reason why some of them are able to rise to the top, is precisely because of their pain and difficulty. The same thing that we complain about is the same reason for their success. As they go through this difficulty, it makes them into something stronger, something better, something more astute. And as a result, they're able to topple the decadent, corrupt, existing institutions. But after they've gotten to the top, they stay there for a bit, then they start to get contaminated by luxuries, there's not enough difficulty facing them. What happens? They crash and burn. And another society rises to take the torch. Uh, I think one of the best examples for this is that of the Mongols, uh, because they rose so quickly and they fell so quickly. Genghis Khan, if you look at his biography, the, the kind of uh, strife he faced when he was younger was unprecedented. He ended up having to kill his older brother, 
Uh, he, is, he was betrayed by his best friend, fought a civil war. I mean, there's so much behind it. And yet, in, uh, in his lifetime, he's able to found the largest contiguous empire in history. But after they get to the top, and they have whatever they need, they become decadent. D despite his best efforts, he knew it would happen, and he tried his best to stay away from it. But it still happened. Now, the old saying goes, up the mountain in wooden clogs, and down again in silken slippers. So to summarize this point, the most skillful of sailors are forged by the stormiest of seas. So how about if I personally, I want to develop patience. I, I want to have a couple of tricks so that when I face difficulty, I have some sort of escape mechanism. Well, apart from the ones that we've already mentioned, there's a couple that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us. So in the 94th surah of the Holy Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, Inna ma'al usri yusra. Surely after difficulty there comes ease. So what he's saying here is that when you're in difficulty, try and think about the time that Allah will give you ease. Try and visualize yourself. Now you're in a dark place, but visualize yourself in the light. See yourself after you've gotten past it and look back. And there's a number of, of, of psychology studies which, uh, which, uh, which talk about how it has an actual physical impact on the human being. That if you can imagine yourself in a positive place or you imagine yourself doing something, it can have physical effects alongside mental effects. And Imam Ali alayhi salam, he promises us that the one who practices sabr will never be deprived of success, even though it may take a long time. As in al So when we're in this dark place, we visualize ourselves again and eventually we'll get there. We'll get there. So that's number one. Number two is that we try not to vocalize our dissatisfaction. Now, I'm not saying useful complaints. Put useful complaints to the side because constructive criticism is important. But I'm talking about the day-to-day the -day moaning, the talking about the talking negative. And we'll, inshallah, in a future talk, we'll go through the importance of speech. But I'll say this for now. Words are like seeds. When you say them, you give life to them. So if you constantly talk negative, if you constantly say negative things, that'll become your reality. So it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. But if you talk positive, no matter how difficult times are, then again, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. And finally, Allah gives us the advice in Surah Al-Baqarah, verse number 156. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. That when disaster strikes them, they say, inna lillahu inna ilayhi raji'un. That surely I am from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and to Allah we shall return. And there's a lot of emphasis on this. In the previous ayah, Allah commands the Holy Prophet to, to congratulate those who have patience, who are, who are able to, to, to understand the saying in its entirety. Because saying inna lillah, it puts everything into context. It gives us perspective. It provides that paradigm shift. Whatever it is that you're going through, the sun will still rise tomorrow. Uh, the, as the old saying goes, don't tell your Allah how big your problems are. Tell your problems how big your Allah is. And when we change the perspective again, the d things we thought were troublesome before, they're no longer. Right? I mean, I think about it this way. The, uh, an analogy which Nurman Ali Khan provided is that if you're in a building right, and you don't like the paint, in times of ease you might uh, comment on it, but you might want to change. But if the building is on fire, you wouldn't, you, you wouldn't even begin to consider something like that. So if in difficulty we remember that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is our master, that ultimately he is good, and ultimately our problems are temporary, they're limited. Why? Because I'm limited, I'm mortal. Eventually I'm going to return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we have trust in the justice of Allah. And as I mentioned before, Allah is the ultimate compensator. But we'll go more into detail under this point, that is of a positive outlook, again in a future talk. We'll have a whole night uh, devoted to that. And we'll finish off here by discussing what the highest level of patience is. Because so far, we've talked about the patience that you and I try and experience, the patience that we have to try and, and put into practice. But the highest level of patience is that of Raba, that of satisfaction. The Holy Prophet advised uh, Abu Dhar al-Ghafari that if you are to act for the pleasure, the rada of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with firm conviction, then do so. And if not, then just persevere. 
So in this narration, he's telling us that perseverance is actually second. The higher level is having satisfaction. So that means that when we reach the state that our will becomes one with the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that whatever we want becomes whatever Allah has wanted, not the other way around. So when we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we don't pray, Ya Allah, can you please change this? It'll be better for me. Can you please change this? It'll be better for me. Rather, we say, Ya Allah, can you please change me so that I can be happy with what you've planned for me? And this is the level that we find in Ahlul Bayt. This is what they have shown us in practice. <laughs> Imam Hassan alayhi salam. After the martyrdom of his father, he looks and sees that his own men are treacherous. He knows that if he continues to fight Muawiyah, it will erode the Muslim Ummah. At such an early juncture, it, was, it would have been a disaster. So he enters into a peace treaty with Muawiyah and he remains patient. And again, just like with Nabi Ayyub alayhi salam, that his own friends thought, thought that he had done something wrong. Even Imam Hassan's close friends came to him alayhi salam, and they, they advised him, don't do this, you're betraying whatever you stood for. But he knew what Allah wanted. He knew what he was doing, and he was patient. And he set a number of conditions in this treaty that would make sure either one of two things would happen. Either number one, the Khalafa would return to Ahlul Bayt, where it belonged. Or number two, Muawiyah would be so thoroughly exposed to posterity that nobody could truly analyze history and declare him one of the rightfully guided Khalifas. There's a reason they say four rightfully guided Khalifas and not five. He has, he has this patience. He manages to, to, to wait until he eventually is poisoned. And Imam Hussein alayhi salam continues with this patience. He sees what is going on, but again he waits, he waits, he perseveres until Muawiyah breaks every single one of the conditions of this treaty. And he appoints Yazid as his successor. And that is the point where Imam Hussein alayhi salam draws, draws the line. And he says, I am not going to be subjugated to this oppressor. 